Hello, hello again. This is uh, Sir David the Bard, uh, Mr. Cockroach. Uh, actually, Mr. Cock, you can call me any of those things. As you know, my ex-wives have uh, many other names that are even worse than that. Um, I want to do a video uh, today. Today is um, about the um, 1st of um, December in uh, 2024. I used to not put the dates on because I thought I was going to live forever. But anyway, um, the more dates you hear, the more you know it's going to be soon. I'll be on the other side. Um, I wanted to do this video today. And again, I just have to be honest. I'm just sitting in my chair and a voice comes in and goes, Hey, hey, yes sir, <laughs> yes sir. You know, yes. I want you to do another video. Oh God, another video. Do I have to humiliate myself? Like, yes, yes you do. I go, okay, Lord, whatever you want, I will go and do the things that the Lord has commanded me. So he said, I want you to do this video on the uh, Rotten to the Core. That's going to be um, the name of this video, Rotten to the Core. Now, um, here's what the video is about. I, I was years ago, I'm 77 now, uh, and now I'm 77 and one hour older than I was on the other video. I went to BYU and I, I somehow graduated from BYU, much to the chagrin of the Mormon church and uh, to me. Um, there were some walls, uh, some hoops, and there were some uh, obstacles uh, for the administration <laughs> for me. Anyway, let that be on the side. This is one of the periods uh, that I want to report. Um, I was married. Uh, I'm going to give her first name uh, because I don't give a shit. I can say whatever I want. My first wife, a sweet girl, Janice. Uh, Janice um, went to BYU and Janice and I were uh, on the ballroom dance team. Um, she was good. I was a shithead. <laughs> but I got on the team. Uh, and I went to the practices, and um, there was a man named Ben De Hoyas. Ben was fabulous in Latin American dancing. He'd just come out of Mexico. Uh, I don't know if he jumped over the border. Uh, I don't know uh, how he got into America, but he was hired by BYU. Fabulous uh, dance uh, instructor, Latin American dance instructor. So I uh, signed up, paid my money to the cult, for the class and went over to the Richards building there and we had uh, ballroom dance practice uh, all the time. Sometimes we dance until our feet bled. Uh, but anyway, Ben De Hoyas was the teacher and there must have been, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 of us in the class and we would be against the wall and there'd be mirrors all against the wall and he'd be out front and he would be teaching uh, the dance steps. Well, he had an assistant. <laughs> Her name was Janice. Jesus. I'm so embarrassed. You know, I'm glad I'll be dead. And all you people will go, I, we never knew him. I don't know. I didn't know. I didn't go to the earth. Hell no, I was somewhere else. I don't know who that guy was. Her name was Janice. And she was an attractive girl. She had uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. And uh, Ben chose her uh, to be his uh, dance partner teaching uh, the ballroom dance team. So I would watch Ben and uh, learn from him, and then I would watch uh, Janice and go, oh, you know, that's, you know, you know how men see and think. God, I wish your panties would drop off. No, I, anyway, I was at BYU. I didn't think about panties in those days. I thought about nothing but panties ever since then. So <clears throat> I saw Janice dancing, and she was cute. She was attractive, um, conservative. Uh, young lady um, and um, very uh, good. She, she knew how to dance and um, I didn't. <laughs> I, I was trying to fake it till I made it, made it but I never made it. I just faked it. So anyway um, I saw her and I thought well uh, you know maybe uh, that's a girl for me. I don't know. So we started dating and um, we went out a couple of times and got along. We spent a lot of time dancing together and we had that in common, and um, uh, I, I was pretty good at Latin American and social dancing, but international dancing, I couldn't do shit. International, waltz, foxtrot, 
uh, and merengue, uh, some of those other dances she was really good at. And when we were dancing <laughs> on the team, now I wasn't a good one. I never went international. I never got on the bus and went anywhere. Uh, I was like third string. <laughs> like if the bus and the whole planet burned down, they go, David, you and your group come up and dance for this group. Okay, I'm, I'm third string. So anyway, um, <clears throat> she used to whisper in my ear. We'd be dancing and looking really fancy and, you know, kind of waving our, our antenna, broadcasting how clever we look. And in those days, God, I had hair. Uh, and I didn't have a gut. And my butt wasn't like, a, you know, the Goodyear blimp. And she was cute. She was a typical BYU girl. She's probably 107 pounds and cute little figure and everything. And so when we danced together, she would go, okay, left foot, now right foot, now bend down, now stand up, now turn. And she would whisper, and I'd just be a robot doing the thing she said because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. So anyway, um, we dated, and um, we, we got together and uh, got married. And... Um, we had our first child, I'll name it to her, Michelle. Uh, I named Michelle, uh, Michelle Shireen, uh, after the Beach Boys, or uh, after the Beatles. Um, Michelle Maybell, that was a very famous song back when she was born. And I used to be a glazer, putting windows in, uh, in Provo while I was going to BYU. I didn't, I wasn't Mitt Romney pulling coupons off of uh, stock returns and paying my tuition. I had to actually fucking work. Like, a white man. Anyway, I was doing a window in a kitchen outside. I was on a ladder outside looking through the window over the sink, putting in this, the kitchen sink. And there's a little girl sitting on the sink, and a tiny little thing, maybe, I don't know, six, seven years old, watching me from the inside put the window in. She was only this far away from me. And I said, hi, how are you? I'm fine. I said, well, what's your name? And she said, Michelle Shireen. I said, Michelle Shireen. I said, that's a fabulous name. It's very, very beautiful, um, and that stuck with me. And so when my daughter uh, Michelle was born, uh, we named her Michelle Shireen, and a uh, very beautiful name. So anyway, um, we had that baby, and then <clears throat> I was at BYU, and and uh, I was matriculating, <laughs> if you want to call it that. I was matriculating like a turtle or a snail. Um, you know, I'd be in one semester and I'd have to run and get money in California, come back and pay the cult more money, and then go back to California, sleep on my parents' floor, and get more money and go back. So anyway, uh, I was persistent and I, I did get a, a degree. Well, we did have then another baby, a uh, beautiful little girl, um, Nicole Monique. Uh, Michelle Shireen, Nicole Monique. And um, Nicole had some... Uh, uh, baby problems. I had to give her a lot of um, shots. Uh, she was sick and had a heart murmur, but she wasn't handicapped in any way. So anyway, a long story short, um, Brigham Young University came to me and said, gee, you know, would you like to um, maybe work here in the uh, recreation department? We know you don't know shit about dance, but this is nepotism. <laughs> oh God, it, it's Mormonism, nepotism. Uh, I didn't have any parents or anybody in authority, but somehow I uh, landed a job uh, in the recreation department. And I was there, I don't know, a year, year and a half. And I taught uh, Latin American dance, I taught social dance, um, a little square dance, um, several dance classes. And I would teach, oh, I don't know, three, three four units a day uh, over in the Wilkinson Center up on the uh, second floor where the wood floors were and everything. So <clears throat> I. Um, really had a lot of uh, uh, interaction with students. See, I was married and I was probably maybe by now, I don't know, maybe 20, 21, and my students were coming in at 18, 19 years old, freshmen. And being a dance teacher, you always have to have uh, a female dance partner so that the girls can see that she's doing things backwards and I'm doing things forward for the boys. Uh, when you're a good teacher, which I was a little bit, I could do the girl's part too. I could dance the boy's part, teach the boys, turn around, do the girl's part. But, <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. 
there's only two weaknesses that I have. I'm perfect everywhere else in my life. Beautiful women and fast cars. Well, they didn't have any fast cars in my dance class. <laughs> Betty showed up. I'm 77, and my heart beats a little bit even faster today. If it beats any faster, the quad bypass is going to fall out of my chest. Anyway, Betty was the cutest damn little thing you ever saw. She had long hair, and she sometimes wore them in ponytails, and sometimes uh, dog tails. And she was a freshman, very innocent, and wanted to learn how to dance and, and acclimate to BYU and find boyfriends and, you know, get a degree and find somebody to marry. I had hundreds, maybe even thousands of girls that came through my classes, and some of them were attractive, but there's certain girls with me, there's just two or three out of thousands that I'm attracted to. The others are beautiful, yeah, I'd love to see them all naked, but there's a couple that show up that I know. I gotta have that. Well, when Betty showed up, I gotta have that. Now, I'm married. Janice is uh, uh, probably seven or eight months pregnant with Nicole. And the, Janice used to come to my classes sometime and play the record player so that, uh, you know, the students could dance and she would listen and help me be a teacher. Well, um, these certain classes Betty uh, signed up for and she would show up and I would say uh, to her, you know, do you want to be uh, my dance partner? And, uh, oh yeah, yeah, see, I feel bad about that when I say that because I should have known better. I was married. I was 20-ish. She was tiny, brand new, a child. Uh, and it's almost uh, quasi child molestation. When you have a, a girl that is basically out of high school and in college and everything is new and she's so excited and whatever and a BYU dance teacher says, hey, you want to be my partner? You know, she's going to fall down and worship you and um, I took advantage of that. I'm ashamed to say that, but I took advantage of it. I was very able to be resistant to thousands and thousands of girls. Never even occurred to me to um, have anything but a dance partner. But Betty was different. And um, we danced a lot. And as a dance teacher, I don't know if I can explain this. Some of you, a few of you will understand that, most won't. But when I see a woman dancing or moving, because I'm trained and because I, I have choreography ability and an ability to, to see what that movement could look like, choreographed, um, when she moved, she moved like a little princess. And th there's times, not often, but there's times in dance situations where you're dancing with somebody. My second wife was like this, uh, Janet. Um, when I would pull Betty in close to me, there was some kind of electrical chemistry. I can't even describe it. She knew where I was going to move, how I was going to move, how strong it was going to be, to the left, to the right, up, down, syncopations, uh, choreographed perfectly with the music. It was like one person, one person. Well, you can see where this is going, <laughs> can't you? Especially the women. <laughs> They're grabbing their husbands and saying, he's an ass, he's the... listen to that ass. <laughs> I can see it right now. So, yeah, I know gender very well. Uh, and I like the other gender <laughs> much better than my gender. Anyway, um, BYU saw us having a little bit of talent, and um, the administration came to us and said, gee, um, we have some uh, competition uh, in Salt Lake City. Would you two like to go up and uh, enter into some competitive dance in Salt Lake City? Now, again, everybody has to take their set of the responsibility. BYU should have never said to me as a, an employee, would you like to take your newfound girlfriend to Salt Lake City and dance with her and be in motels and change uh, costumes and uh, have that uh, intimate kind of a relationship going on? They should have known better. They didn't, and I was young and uh, stupid, and I should have known better. Well, 
Um, we went up to Salt Lake, we danced, and uh, then, of course, you know, we stopped and get a pizza going home, and we would sit at the motel or table or at the picnic table outside and talk and talk, and you know how that shit goes. You know, I'm not talking to children here. Uh, you spend time, you get locked in an elevator with a 700 pound woman uh, that has nine vaginas, is blind and deaf, uh, and is ugly as a mud fence, after, you know, 24 hours, uh, she's going to look like Marie Osmond. That's just life. That's just human beings when you put them in close proximity like that, and they talk, and they're on the phone, or they're, not these days, texting, or they're, um, you know, sending pictures, um, etc. That's going to go to shit. That's going to ruin your life. And it, it ruined my life and it ruined uh, the life of uh, Janice and my two girls. Now, <clears throat> I have to take some of that responsibility. I was a father. I was a husband. Uh, I loved dance. That was high motivation. Well, it was part motivation. She was so cute. She was darling. That was a lot of the motivation. And my wife was seven or eight months pregnant. I hate to admit that, but you know, I love women that are three, four, five months pregnant, but God, at eight or nine months, uh, you know, you're dancing with the Goodyear blimp. Uh, and um, anyway, the fact of the matter was um, my wife, Janice, was a very faithful woman. She was a good woman. She was a, a good mother and a good woman. Uh, she just married uh, an ass. I didn't know that at the time, and she didn't either, or she would have said, fuck you, I'm out of here. Uh, she did after we got divorced, she said, fuck you, I'm out of here. But anyway, um, Janice was working at D's. Uh, you don't even know what D's is, it's like McDonald's back in the years at Provo. At the D's hamburger place, right below the uh, entrance to the campus there at BYU. She went to work every day for seven or eight hours trying to help the family and support it. I was teaching at BYU uh, with the uh, dance classes. Well, <laughs> if you watch my videos, you're going to sit down. I had an idea. <laughs> Jesus Christ. When bipolar people, and especially David the Bard, has an idea, <laughs> it's going to be a fucking catastrophe. And it was. So I said to Betty, uh, gee, uh, you know, my house is over here, uh, and it's only a few miles here from the campus. Maybe you'd like to come over, and uh, uh, my family's not home right now. We'll be alone was the implication. And, um, you know, maybe you'd be interested in coming over and, and uh, seeing how a good dance teacher lives. Jesus, I'm so embarrassed. But the Lord asked me to, to confess. I never confess to a bishop. <laughs> anyway, I'm confessing to you. And they can't excommunicate me now because I resigned <laughs> 20 years ago. So she goes, okay, see, innocence. And, and I feel bad when I say that, it emotionally hits me because um, it, it's horrid to me for anybody, male or female, but mostly males, to take advantage of innocence, of curiosity. Gee, I'm going to buy you a candy bar here. I'm going to buy you a car here. You know, that's evil. That is solid fucking evil. I, I don't care how you turn it and twist it. Well, she's innocent. You, okay, sure, I'll come over to your house. Okay. Well, I'd never been involved in anything like that before or after. Uh, and uh, she came over. And we kind of sat around the, the kitchen and the dining room and whatever. And I don't know how this shit happens. You know more about this than I do. Somehow we made it to the bedroom. Now, I don't know if we were inspired. I don't know if we were drunk. We didn't have any drinks. I don't know if we gravitated, floated to, or I dragged her like a caveman with her hair to the bedroom. Well, anyway, we got on the bed. And um, we started kissing and making out. And I'm going, well, at this time, I'm not thinking at all. My, my brain is, is below my belt. My brain is now below my belt. And uh, my brain uh, doesn't say, you know, this is immoral. This, my brain doesn't say, you are betraying your family. 
and your wife. My brain didn't say you are reflecting. Uh, I'm Brigham Young University. You're a dance teacher. Uh, you're LDS. You promised, uh, you know, to be morally clean and to represent the university properly. And you've got this young thing in bed, and uh, you're humping on her, and uh, you came in your pants. And I go, well, huh. So I took her back to school. Well, being the person that I am, <laughs> that was part of the person that I was then, I went home and I felt uh, guilty and I felt um, uh, that I needed to uh, say something to my wife. I didn't want to be uh, behind, uh, I was behind the eight ball, believe me. So I said to Janice, uh, what happened? Well. She sat over in the corner of the kitchen, just was crying and screaming, pulling her hair, uh, going insane. And uh, that surprised me a little bit because I was stupid. I didn't really know what I had done. I didn't understand the consequences. And males were stupid that way. You know, the female can clearly see uh, this, this is a clusterfuck. Uh, this is going to have some problems. And it did. It's been, you know, 70 years of nothing but problems. So anyway, uh, the next day she started talking about a divorce and I thought, well, uh, okay, um, again, I'm stupid, young, and um, we filed for a divorce on Wednesday. Two days later, it was final. Only the Bard could pull that shit off in Utah. In those days, there had to be a six-month waiting period for finalization after the filing. Uh, but we lied uh, to the court that we had been apart for six months. So the court immediately uh, granted that divorce. Well, any of you that have been in divorce, you're, you were looking at this video and going, God damn, you know, he's bringing up a thousand triggers. Everything, you know, you lose your car, you lose your house. L let me put a sideline in here. So after the divorce, <laughs> I had an idea. <laughs> Betty lived in Colorado. So I thought, wow. I think now that I'm free, yeah, free, I think I'll drive to Colorado. Just say hi to her, meet her family. <laughs> I was stupid. I showed up and uh, she came outside uh, and uh, said, uh, my dad wants to talk to you. I go, oh, maybe he thinks I'm a good catch. Maybe he thinks that uh, divorcing my wife and being a BYU teacher and I'm being three or four years older than his daughter, he's going to fall down and beg me <laughs> to give her a chance at marriage. Well, that's not really what happened. A long story short, he said, get the fuck out of here. Don't talk to my daughter. Don't be around my daughter. Uh, I'm going to get my shotgun. It went on and on. So I thought, well, that didn't go over really well you know what I mean. So, now, here, rotten to the core. How does that fit in? I, as a counselor, I've had uh, thousands of people that I've counseled with and since then and whatever. Um, there are some people that are rotten to the core. They're not going to change. They're liars. They're cheaters, they're scammers, they're drug, al al they're drug addicts, they're alcoholics, um, they're bums, they don't want to work, they have no motivation, they want to scam people, they love pyramids, they love um, uh, not working, um, they're bums. Yeah, they're human, yeah, they're human, um, but uh, there's a difference between a brick of gold and a brick. <coughs> Some of these people are just plain bricks. So a lot of times in counseling, people have come to me, and there's been um, some infidelity. Um, I didn't have intercourse with this young woman. Uh, I just, you know, humped her and came in my pants, and you know that that was the end of that situation. Uh, but it has a ripple effect, if you know what I mean. Here we are, 60 years later, it's still rippling out. The good things ripple out. The bad things ripple out. So people will say to me in counseling, well, do you think I should uh, divorce him? Or uh, she uh, did this or she did that. Um, and I want to break up. I want to divorce. I want to, they're not going to change. Here's what I've learned <clears throat> for whatever good it does anybody. 
If a person is indeed rotten to the core, they're toxic, get the hell away from them. The sooner, the better, the further, and the longer you can run, the better. But making that judgment is hard. Now, I made a mistake, a, a serious mistake, a very serious mistake, uh, gross, uh, ruined uh, my life at that time, and the other three, Michelle and Nicole and Janice, uh, it ruined their lives, uh, basically, the rest of their lives. Now, <clears throat> Christ gave us a good example of the woman who was caught in adultery, and the town wanted to stone her, and Christ, of course, said, you know, he who is without sin cast the first stone, and then he said, you know, where are uh, thy uh, accusers? They all left because they had skeletons in their closet. And he simply said to her, go and sin no more. She wasn't rotten to the core. I think Christ saw that, and Christ gave that to us as an example to judge correctly. Judge correctly. The age, the gender, the circumstances, the emotional, the mental, the spiritual, the physical, the financial, all wrapped around the event. We have to put those all in the formula to say, is this person rotten to the core? I believe very strongly, I could change tomorrow, but I believe at this point, I believe that the core person never changes. The core person is the core person. They're not going to change. But now it's like the core of a body. You can put arms on a core. You can put legs. It can now walk. It can now move. So the principle I'm trying to uh, allude to here is that <clears throat> if the core person is indeed a brick and not a brick of gold, uh, it's toxic. Get that hell away. But be careful because sometimes what comes around does go around. There seems to be some principle there that is eternal. If we make snap judgments many times, um, those kinds of judgments can come back uh, and haunt us uh, forever. So I think what we need to do is take all of the pieces of that puzzle around that event and evaluate it subjective or objectively, objectively, factual, factual, not our emotion, not what we think, not what the church is trained us, not, not anything. Look at each one of the facts, and then you and I be responsible and say, John, can that person change? Given the opportunity and an even playing field and an opportunity to repent, to, uh, I hate that word, uh, that they can reorganize themselves, their morals, <coughs> their standards. Um, if there's hope for that, I really think the principles of Christ cause us to lean on giving them another chance. Now I know, because I've dealt with a lot of females in counseling and a lot of males in counseling, the females are much more willing to forgive, they never forget, don't ever kid yourself. She'll say, well in 1826 at 2.30 in the morning on the third step, you left that, you know, women, they forgive, but they don't forget. Men, they're more of, a, of an aberration. A man is not that predictable whether he'll forgive or forget. Um, we're hunters, uh, you know. Some of us will hunt down uh, um, paramos, and, and some of us say, no, you're out. The door is gone. I don't want your ass in here anymore. Other men will go, all right, well, you said you wouldn't do it. This is your 32nd time. Um, with the 33rd, will you stop? Men are much more... Um, uh, indiscriminate. It's hard to predict uh, on that gender what they're going to do. But the point that I'm making is if the core person is shit, then flush them. Just flush them. But if they're young, like I was, they were stupid, like I was, they're naive, like I was, that basically uh, I never had a position where I was important on campus, oh, he's a professor, oh, he works for BYU, oh, he's important. I never had been inflated that way. That was all new information to me, and uh, it went to my head, and it went to the other head this time. 
So you have to put together, I think, we, not you, me and you and the rest of us have to put together the entire situation and evaluate. Now, here's what I would suggest. I'm saying as a counselor, two master's degrees, as a counselor, I would rather err on the side of forgiving. Now, I have a saying, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, I sue you. Important principle. I'll forgive once, but twice or three times, now I'm saying, God, you know, no. We all have to learn to say no. That's the most powerful word in the human language, no. So, if you find yourself, your mate, your girlfriend, uh, if, you know, whatever, your gender, your, your sexual orientation, uh, uh, th those emotions are all there, whether you're a lesbian, you're gay, you're transgender, uh, bimillennial, or whatever. Those are all human emotions. If you have humility yourself, and you're a follower of our Heavenly Father, he said forgive 70 times 70. I, I think that's going too far. Uh, that's what he says. <laughs> And the bard is saying, uh, that may be going too much. Believe him, believe me. Take your choice. I think giving a person at least one chance. I would rather err that way and see if it was just a stupid, uh, drunken state or drug stupid this or locked in an elevator for three days or uh, you, you, you trapped in a submarine and you couldn't get out and the BYU cheerleader team was in there with you and you were the only man and they all wanted to have a baby. Um, I think we have to evaluate. And I, as a counselor, um, I would say I would lean on the side of forgiving uh, at least once. Now it's up to you. Maybe you want to forgive two, three, five, seventy times seventy. I think that has to be individual. But to just slam the damn door with one uh, indiscretion, uh, even though it, it could be a gross indiscretion, um, I think shows uh, a lack of wisdom, a lack of experience, a lack of knowledge. And if our egos are so weak that we just have to chop off the head the first time somebody looks at somebody else or somebody, you know, uh, has some kind of a uh, innuendo of interest in somebody else. Uh, to cut the, her head off of that person right then and there, I think will come back to bite us on the butt. I really do. I think that will come back to bite us. And, um, you know, it ruins children's lives. It ruins the spouse, the grandparents, the great-grandparents, the grandchildren. It's a ripple that goes out. That's an important uh, rock that you would throw and I throw in the pond how we want that to ripple through the eternities. Um, it caused a divorce. Uh, it caused, um, you know, uh, estranged uh, feelings between me and the children still today. 77 years old. Those children and I don't really communicate. So, I'm telling this story to try to illustrate if a person is rotten to the core, screw them. Flush them. If they're a piece of shit, flush them. They're toxic, they're going to ruin your life. You have a right to protect yourself. But, if you're 18, 19, 20, 24, uh, even late 20s, uh, they should know better. But these younger people, they're stupid. They're, they're totally, they have no experience. Uh, all they have is a, a vagina that's as wet as uh, the Pacific Ocean and, and a dick a mile long, and that makes a lot of their decisions for them, and, and they will make mistakes. Now, I have a principle that I, I teach very strongly in my counseling, and that is we all make mistakes. Now, be careful. Be careful. We make one mistake. If we make the same mistake twice, we're an idiot. We're a fool, and people should shit on us. That's the way I counsel. I make mistakes once. I never do it again. I implement that into my life, into my finances, my morality, into my relationships, and that's it. So, when people say to you and me, Oh, nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. 
that is a cover-up for bullshit. We are on a learning curve. We will make misjudgments. That's a mistake. Misjudgment is a mistake. We can correct that. We have to take responsibility. We have to make restitution. And we have to be responsible to ourselves. Don't repeat it. When I did AA counseling, the big book, the blue book, uh, insanity in AA is defined as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Brilliant. Insanity. So, if you stand behind, oh, nobody's perfect, oh, we all make mistakes, and that's your excuse for being a 14-carat asshole, fuck you. Your friends, your wife, your husband, your children should put you down the road. It is fair to say, gee, I made a misjudgment, I did make a mistake. I'm going to correct that mistake and I won't be doing it again. That's the kind of a human being I kind of want to be around. That's a pe person that's gaining experience, uh, they're taking responsibility, uh, they're developing wisdom, and uh, they're humble. There's a lot of qualities there that I like. Now let me give you uh, somewhat the end of this story. Um, the end might be lightning when it comes to I don't know. My wife, my second wife, Jeannie, the cheerleader, beautiful girl. Oh my God, I've been blessed. Beautiful girl, cheerleader. Basically, Jeannie and I went to a dance in Oklahoma at the church, Mormon church. We we're in the rec hall. And I was, you know, talking to people and dancing with uh, Je Jeannie, my wife, and pretty soon I, I had my back uh, turned and Jeannie said, oh, David, I want you to meet uh, my best friend, Deanie. I turned around like an 18-wheeler ran me over. There was a, a response between Deanie and I that was unbelievable. I mean... I was a total giant erection, and she was a huge wet vagina. We wanted to dance. Now, I'd had this other experience with Betty. That pulled the trigger. Did I learn? Was I rotten to the core? I knew that Deanie and I would hit it off in a minute. We could have gone out in the parking lot and populated a world. I looked at her, and she looked at me, and then Dini said, well, David, um, they have a kissing booth here in the uh, dance in the auditorium, and uh, I'm running the kissing booth. Um, maybe you'd like to visit the booth. And I said, God dang, I would. I would. But then I learned the wisdom the experience, I wasn't rotten to the core, came to me and said, David, this ain't your first rodeo. You've ridden this horse before, if you know what I mean. And you got bucked off. You ruined three people's lives and your own. You made a fool of yourself. You embarrassed the university. You scared an innocent um, student to death and her parents that they would think, you and hook up with her. You want to go down that road again? I said, no. No. I'm not rotten to the core. I made a mistake, a serious mistake. Betrayal ruined people's lives. A judgment that, you know, uh, was like murdering three or four people. A terrible mistake. So, Deanie went to the uh, kissing booth. And I watched, if you know what I mean. Oh, Jesus. I turned to my wife, Jeannie, and I said, uh, Jeannie, we're leaving. What do you mean? The day is just starting. I said, no. We're leaving. Well, I don't understand. I said, well, you really probably never will understand unless she sees this video, which she throws the videos in the toilet and flushes them as quick as she can, being an ex-wife. She's going to be one of the ones that pees on my tombstone. So we left. I never heard, talked to, or saw 
Deanie ever again. Jeannie continued to be her friend, but I never talked to her, I never went to her house, I never was there again, because I wasn't rotten to the core. I made a terrible mistake. So I don't know if that's going to help anybody. I don't know if, if that story is going to relate to anybody. 50% of, of the uh, marriages in the United States uh, go bad. Uh, and, and most of that, some of it's over money, but most of it's over infidelity and people hooking up with other people. So I think we need to give each other uh, hope. I think that we need to reach down to, like Christ did the prostitute, and say to a mate that's hurt us deeply, cut us deeply, go and sin no more. Now, here's what I've found, and I want to be very honest, and I'm just giving you my experience. This may be bullshit. It may not be true at all. You decide for yourself. I have found that boys, but mostly girls, that have been raped or molested never get over it. It's a trigger there forever. It's like an abortion. You know, everybody has a different take on this, but I'm a counselor and I've seen and counseled many women who've had an abortion. It's so traumatizing, it's a trigger and it never goes away. Now, as a counselor, am I saying, oh, they're lot ruined for life, they'll never be good uh, in bed sexually, they can't get along with a husband? No, I'm not saying any of that at all. But what I am saying is that any little girl that has been molested or raped, the way you touch her, the way you talk to her, she is full of triggers that are never going to go away. They're never going to go away. Yeah, they'll go to the back of her mind a little bit as years go on, and as she gets more trust and more compatibility with her new partner, they will fade, but they will never disappear. So when you touch her, when you talk to her, your inflection, your voice, your volume, uh, the, the time of the day, the lights in the room, she wants it always dark, she never wants it dark, she doesn't like that song, she doesn't like that music, there's a million triggers in there that have traumatized this little human being. And when she grows into being a woman, and now you've got her on her back in bed, and you think she's going to put out and uh, scream and yell, and, and you're going to bring the bedboard uh, against the wall until the drywall falls off, um, you have to be more understanding. You have to be more patient. You have to be more cautious. And you have to take the, the I'm talking about girls now, in her totality, in her totality, you have to respect and understand what she's been through. You'll never understand it. You know, I was in sixth grade and I wanted my sixth grade teacher to rape me every damn day. You know, I was begging for her to rape me. Um, and, uh, you know, boys are, are a little different. So, a little girl that has been traumatized that way, those triggers are there forever. As you work with her, as she gets more trained with you, more trust, more wisdom, more experience, that you've turned her and her mind around sexually, that you're not triggering that, oh, I remember this happened, this happened, the lights were on, that music was playing, that smell of bread, all those triggers are in her little brain. You're going to have to be, as a husband and a male partner, very patient, very understanding, and communication between the two of you is essential. If you don't have good communication, that, that's going to be a divorce. Eventually, three years, five years, 18, 20 years, it's going to be a divorce. She has to say to you, these are my triggers. And he has to say, okay, let's talk about those triggers. I'm not that same person. I'm not going to say those things. I'm not going to touch you this way, speak to you this way, etc. So that is a very complex uh, dynamics. So going back to the end of my video here, and you know, I tell a short story always long. If you're rotten to the core, and you have a person who's rotten to the core, it's toxic. There's a saying, revenge is like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. Will Rogers said, Men learn three ways only. They go to school, 
they read books, they pee on an electric fence. I don't want to pee on an electric fence. Maybe you do, I don't. Einstein said, the universe and stupidity are infinite. And I'm not that sure about the universe. Ron White, the comedian, says, you can't fix stupid. You cannot fix stupid. As humans, we have to put all of this information in a salad bowl in our brain and look at the relationship we're in, look at the person, look at the history, look at their family, look at their finances, their moral, their spiritual, their background, their experiences, and we have to just decide, are they rotten to the core or should we forgive? We may never forget, it will fade. Triggers will be there. But if he screwed around at the office with a secretary, <clears throat> and now he only has male secretaries, that shows a little bit of uh, mistake that has been fixed. I never had any affair since. I've never had any before. All of my girlfriends before BYU, um, I uh, was true to, and all after Betty, I've been true to. I've never called anyone. You can look at my phone and text you people that hide that shit in your phone. You're pretty much rotten to the core. If, if you're going behind the back of a person uh, that you say you love, that you've uh, you know had a baby with, that you, you, uh, you know have um, sex with at night and you're both in another world and you turn around and you text or you're looking with your binoculars uh, you know at the other condo uh, bedroom window uh, you're rotten to the core but we have to be forgiving of ourselves we have to be forgiving of others and no there's nobody perfect but we want to be as perfect as we can now let me leave this video with this <clears throat> two words <laughs> you know me now the less the words, the more the truth. People who give you millions of words are lying to you. The truth usually comes in one or two words. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hate those two words. I'm sorry. Here's what that means. Now, it's a simple two phrases, or two words and a phrase. But here is the connotation today and it's been this way, probably will continue to be this way in the English dialect and language and evolution. When a person says to you, I'm sorry, I say now to people on the phone and people that are my plumbers and subcon, oh, I'm sorry. I learned a very important lesson on this. I made a mistake when I was working with my son in a delivery business and I screwed up and I said to him on the phone, uh, gee, Dan, I'm sorry. He said, okay, what are you going to do to see this never happens again? Out of the mouths of babes. Oh, see, when humans say, I'm sorry, here's what they're saying to you. I'm stupid. I'm irresponsible. I'm uneducated. I didn't do my homework. I've been careless. I didn't really consider your feelings. And basically, I want you to cop blodge, forgive me for being such a bitch or an asshole to you because I'm saying this not because I'm sincere, but I'm saying this because I want to keep my job or I'm saying this because I have a uh, motivation for myself. I didn't give a shit about you when I did this and I don't give a shit about you now and you are required, you're required to forgive me because I say two words to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. And they've ripped your head off. They've ripped off your penis. They've wrecked your car. They've burned your house to the ground. Uh, the insurance didn't pay. Um, you know, uh, they, they ripped the brain out of your baby uh, during brain surgery. Oh, I'm sorry. Be careful. I don't believe in I'm sorry. 
When people say that to me these days, in my old age, I can say shit. When you're old, you can do whatever the fuck you want. Because, oh, he's old, he's stupid. But anyway, I say to people, I charge a thousand dollars a word. I'm, which is I am, but I'm going to count it as one word. Sorry, two words. You owe me two thousand dollars. Or you can say, gee, I made a mistake, David. How can I fix it? and I'll make sure it never happens again to you or anybody else. Now I'm happy. Now I feel the principles of Christ improving us. No, we're not perfect yet, but damn, we're getting close there. We're getting close. So when people say, I'm sorry, I basically say, fuck you. You're not sorry. You wouldn't have done this to me if you were sorry. But if you're really repentant, I hate that word. If you're really um, trying to make restitution, if you're really trying to repair the situation, tell me you made a mistake in judgment. Basically, you're going to fix that. You're going to try to put me back together the best way you can, and then you're going to treat me different in the future, and everybody else in this situation you come to the rest of your life, you're going to make sure you have this piece of wisdom and don't treat them this way ever again. So, rotten to the core, I'm going to say there's a lot more rotten to the core than you want to believe. I was naive. I I'm growing up. I'm 77 years old. I'm growing up. I've just been watching YouTube on um, stupidity. A man uh, in about 1977 wrote a treatise, a uh, book. Uh, it wasn't a book. It was an essay on stupidity. Uh, he has an entire theory on stupidity, and uh, it's now integrated into uh, psychology and seems to have true principles. I used to think years ago, right until the last five or six years of my life, even into my early 70s, that most people were honest. They're sincere. They're kind. They're loving. They're compassionate. I used to want to believe that and I did I was stupid and I was naive now in my last hours of being here on this planet I'm saying at this point and I could change next week but I'm telling you I think 80 percent of the general population are profoundly stupid <clears throat> they may excel in one or two areas I've come across this with the federal court here in Salt Lake City judges that I've come up against can be brilliant in a very tight-knit, stereo, um, uh, pigeonhole area. 